the enemy is externalized. So maybe it's Batman and the Joker. And the Joker's a pretty, the Joker's really a figure of, of chaotic evil, fundamentally. You know, in the best Batman movie, um, which was the one with, uh, well, with the Joker, and, and it wasn't Jack Nicholson. Who, who played the Joker? Heath Ledger. Yeah, yeah, Heath Ledger. You know, that was rough on old Heath, and no wonder, you know, because he embodied this archetypal character. And that Joker was so much of an adversary that he didn't even want to win. Right, you can understand adversaries that want to win. It's adversaries that want to make everyone lose that are really hard to understand, and that's part of what made that movie, you know, relatively striking and memorable, and he really embodied that character well. And so, one, here's two sets of characters that make up stories. Hero and adversary. Okay? So, and you can, you can understand that at multiple levels simultaneously. Um, here's another set of characters. Now, Here's why I think these characters are fundamental elements of our cognitive structure, cognitive substructure. First of all, I think that really what we want to know is not what is, but we want to know how to act, how to conduct ourselves in the world. We're moving creatures, right? We don't just sit there on a rock and filter seawater through our gills. We have to go out there and contend with the world, and so we need to know how to do that. We need to know how to do it and how not to do it, so we can look for good examples and we can look for bad examples. And we don't want just any old good example. We want a good example that's boiled right down to excellent example, and we want a bad example that's boiled right down to excellent bad example. And so a good example would be a character who is an amalgam of all the good things about good people, and an evil character would be an amalgam of all the evil things about bad people. And the more pure, in some sense, in essence, both of those characters are, the more archetypal the story. And so an archetypal story is good versus evil. And you might think you don't believe in good versus evil, but... It doesn't really matter what you believe, because when you go to movies, you watch that, and you watch it as if you believe it. And I would say, this is an existential claim, by the way, is that it doesn't matter what you say you believe, because what do you know about it? What matters is how you act out what you believe. And if you really want to find out what you believe, you don't ask yourself what you believe. You watch yourself act, and you deduce from that what you believe. And so... If you don't believe, for example, in a good versus evil archetypal struggle, then what are you doing watching Star Wars, for example? Okay, because obviously that's an archetypal story, just like Harry Potter is an archetypal story, and both of those are archetypal stories about good versus evil. Okay, next set of categories. So imagine that we've been living in familial groups for who knows how long. Let's say... Three million years, just for the sake of argument. We were living in tribal groups way, way longer than that. You know, if, if you think about a tribal group as something that might extend back farther than chimpanzees. We were living in dominance hierarchies for way longer than tribal groups. But the family group, you've got to think we've been living in family groups for about as long as we've been extraordinarily dependent as infants and as long as we've had really large brains. And so again, that's, you, you can't, draw you know, a, a tight line but because we've been getting bigger and bigger brains for quite a long time. But it's, it's in the millions of years, let's say. And so, and the other thing that you might think about is that, you know, your cognitive apparatus, your perceptual apparatus, your emotional apparatus has originated within an environment, obviously. Now, we tend to think of the environment as the natural environment, and then we tend to think of the natural environment as like a forest. But the natural environment for for primates, say, is only forest to some degree. I mean, first of all, we, we didn't just dwell in forests because we were also veldt-dwelling creatures. But also, we, we didn't really dwell among trees. We dwelled among other primates like us. And so our primary environment is actually other people. And then you might say, okay, what are the fundamental categories of the other people? Well, how about mother? That's a big one. Because the probability that you had a mother is like, it's up there at about 100%. You know, and if there wasn't, so even if, you're, if you lost your biological mother at birth, if someone didn't fulfill the archetypal role of mother, then you don't live. And th that doesn't just mean providing you with food and water and shelter. Because if you provide a child under one with food and water and shelter, and that's it, they die. You have to pick them up. You have to touch them. You have to rock them back and forth. You have to communicate with them. If you don't give them physical attention, their nervous systems shut down and they die. And so that's part of the reason why in 
Well, in Eastern European orphanages, orphanages before the wall fell down, the death rate, especially in places like Romania in the orphanages, it's an awful story, was unbelievably high. And if the kids didn't die, they were just so crippled psychologically that they never recovered. And that was because people didn't touch them and didn't interact with them. And so you need a creature playing out the archetypal role of mother to entice you into life. Otherwise, you just perish. So mother, that's a category, man. And then, well, father's a category too, and it's the same thing applies there. And even if you don't have a father, there's a male power structure around you, a dominance hierarchy, roughly speaking, that acts in the paternal role. And there's no getting away from that unless you don't live in a society, and then if you don't live in a society, then you just die because you can't live by yourself. So father and mother are primary categories, and then there's the primary category of the individual. Because wherever you are, there you are. And that's been the case for every human being that's ever existed. So the fundamental categories are individual, mother, and father. Well, and there's another fundamental category which we alluded to, which is horrible thing that lives at the bottom of a pit that will devour you. And that has a psychological reality and an objective reality. And that's, as I said, that's equivalent to the story of Jonah being gobbled up by the whale. You never learn something without having something small die. And sometimes you learn something and something big dies. And then, you know, you put yourself back together and you pick up the pieces and you emerge unscathed, hopefully, and perhaps transformed and you carry on. And so the human developmental story isn't an upward march in a linear manner, you know, up an even slope. It's perhaps upwards and onwards, but it's like this. It's punctuated by catastrophes. We successfully make a passage from aimless and disobedient character to someone who was alive on shore and pursuing a particular path. It's the same motif. It's a very, very, very common motif. And the reason for that is that that's how people transform. You know, they hit an obstacle of some sort that just blows them into pieces. They go down into the depths, into the abyss. And they, they live down there for a while, and it's not pleasant. And maybe they learn something while they're down there, if they're lucky, and they get back up. And that's the story of human development.